Uh oh, updates. All right, quick uh, introduction for everybody. This is Ron Ricard, a uh, uh, one of our business partners for tax deferred exchanges and tax deferral strategies. And I'm going to let Ron take it away because he knows a lot more about this than I do. <laughs> Thank you, Mike, and thanks for the opportunity to talk to your group. Um, so uh, my name is Ron Ricard. I work for a company called Investment Property Exchange or IPX 1031. We are what is referred to as a qualified intermediary. We help uh, you and your clients do 1031 exchanges. Um, hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, if you want to uh, tap the QR code there, then uh, that downloads my contact information. So if you want to keep that handy, um, because one thing I do I want to say to you is that you are never expected to become experts in 1031 exchanges. That is not your job. Don't feel that you ever have to be. My job is to make your job easier. So anything that I can do to make your job easier, that's what I'm here for. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, and figure out what 1031s are. But again, do not ever feel that you have to become an expert in this stuff. Your your job is to help your clients buy and sell real estate, and uh, I'm here to help you when it comes to a certain part of that market. So, what is 1031? 1031 refers to a section of the tax code. Oh, by the way, before I forget, um, if you have any questions, put them in the chat box, in the, and then um, at, once we are done, I will open up the chat, and then assuming we have a little more time, I'll open up to general questions, but at, as you have questions, as we go, please put them in the chat. Um, anyway, 1031 is part of the tax code. It's the tap part of the tax code that allows you to sell investment real estate, buy replacement investment real estate, and in doing so, you get to defer paying taxes on the profit that you've made. Now, important word there, defer, not eliminate. So you have a rental house. Your client wants to, you to sell a rental house. You list the property. You go through the regular escrow process. At the close of escrow, the money comes to a third party called the intermediary. That's us. You then go help them find what the, a replacement property that they want to purchase. You go through that regular escrow process, and then we send the money to the title company there. So you're selling something, you're selling investment real estate, you're buying investment real estate, and as long as you don't touch the money, because we had it, then you get to defer paying taxes on the profit that you've made. Now, that's an important word, though, defer not eliminate. So if you sell a rental house to buy a duplex, later you sell another, do another exchange, sell that duplex to buy a fourplex. Now you're old and tired of sick of real estate. If you sell that fourplex, you pay taxes from the house, the duplex, and the fourplex. You are just deferring paying taxes. It does not eliminate the taxes. So oftentimes people will ask me at this point, well, why bother doing an exchange if I'm going to have to pay the taxes anyway? There are two reasons we always want to do an exchange. Number one, do you want to pay your taxes today or tomorrow? For most of us, the answer is tomorrow. The way I look at it is this. If you have, if you have a $600,000 gain on a property, which is pretty common these days, and you don't do an exchange, you're going to pay $200,000 to the government in taxes on average. But, by, but because you're doing an exchange, you don't have to give the government that $200,000. You get to use that money yourself to buy more real estate. But the real reason you do an exchange is because ultimately, you hopefully never have to pay the taxes. Because sadly, one day, we're all going to die. And when you die, you win. Well, when you die, your kids win. Because when you die, whoever inherits the property from you gets what's called a step up in basis. Make sure we understand this. I bought a property many years ago for 100,000. Today it's worth a million. If I sell it, I have a $900,000 gain to pay tax on. But whoever inherits the property from me, for the day I die, whoever inherits that property from me, their basis on the property is the value of the property the day I die. And if your kids are like mine, the day after my funeral, they're selling everything. And when they sell it for a million dollars, how much capital gain do they have? Zero. It's worth a million dollars when I die. That becomes their basis. Now, if they own it for a while, it goes up in value. Now there's a gain in the property. But if they sell it right away, there is no gain. All the taxes that I would have paid 
while I was alive, all disappear when I die. That's the real beauty of the 1031 is that hopefully you, nobody ever has to pay the taxes at all. So anyway, so again, the 1031 is just a tax deferral strategy, not tax elimination. All right. Now, there's a term you often hear in 1031. That term is like kind. If you ever talk to an accountant or an attorney, they don't call them 1031s. They call them like kind exchanges. That term, though, is very misleading. Any kind of exchange, uh, investment real estate can be exchanged for any other kind. So you can sell a rental house and buy a commercial office building. You can sell a farm and buy an apartment building. You can even sell bare land and buy other rental property, uh, commercial property, industrial property, any kind of investment real estate for any other kind. That term like kind actually dates back many years. We used to do exchanges on things other than real estate. In my 20 plus years of doing this, I've done exchanges on airplanes. Well, you sold an airplane, you had to buy an airplane. I've done exchanges on artwork, sell a piece of art, buy a piece of art. Then exchanges on farm equipment, buy farm equipment, sell farm equipment. So again, the key here is that like kind has to do when we used to do exchanges with what we call personal property. But those days are gone. We no longer have any kind of personal property exchanges. Right now, 1031 is only about real estate. And so don't get hung up on that term like kind, any investment real estate for any other. But I did say it has to be investment real estate. So, oh, by the way, another thing that's like kind, um, forgot to mention, also any leases and permanent easements um, are also considered to be real estate. Um, so I often will do exchanges in like the island of Oahu or by Stanford University or in the Sierras. There's a lot of government owned land where people have been built cabins. And those are all buildings built on leased land. As If the lease is at least 30 years, it still qualifies for 1031, which is pretty cool. Also, um, we have done we do exchanges on people who are selling permanent rights, like conservation easements or their water rights. Again, those you can do an exchange as well. Um, but again, it has to be investment real estate. So what kind of real estate is not investment? Well, your primary residence is not considered to be investment real estate. Now, there's another section of the tax code, section 121, that says that if you're single and you've bought, you've lived in your house at least two years, you get to keep the first $250,000 of taxable gain. If you're married, you get to keep $500,000. If your gain is more than that, then you pay taxes on whatever the excess gain is. Some of you are probably too young to remember, but it used to be that when you sold your primary residence, you had to go use that money to go buy another primary residence. But though that law is gone, it doesn't exist anymore. Now, when you sell your primary residence, you have, um, and if your gain is what if your gain is more than the exemption, you pay taxes. It does not matter whether you buy another house or not. Now, five hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money back in nineteen ninety seven when this law was passed. But as you can imagine, in the last 20 plus years, prices, prices have gone up. And nowadays, $500,000, especially here in the Bay Area, isn't a lot of gain. So we have a lot of clients who have gained way in excess of that $500,000. So what do we tell them to do? Well, there are a couple of things. First off, does any portion of your property qualify? Do you have an ADU? Do you, do you, do you as realtors have a home office? Is there any percentage of the property that you are, and this is the important part, reporting on your tax return already as investment real estate? If you're already reporting that 10% of your house is home office, then 10% of your house qualifies for 1031 because 10% of it is considered to be commercial real estate. So the big takeaway here for you is ask the question. If you're dealing with somebody who has a listing appointment and you know they've live, lived there for a long time and you're pretty sure or even certain that their gain on their property is more than the two hundred fifty dollars or $500,000 exclusion, ask the question, do you rent out any of your house? Do you have a home office? Is there any portion of your property that you're already declaring on your taxes? 
they may not realize they could take advantage of both tax rules at the same time. So um, it's it's something that a lot more people can qualify for this and they than they realize. So ask the question. But not everybody has a home office. Not everybody has an ADU. So if you have a client who has a highly appreciated primary residence, what do we tell them to do? Move out. Turn your house into a rental property. Now, after you've been renting it for a couple of years, is that house now an investment? Yes. Is it still considered to be a primary residence? Yes, because it still meets the criteria of having lived in the property two of the last five years. And because you meet both criteria, you could take advantage of both tax rules at the same time. So if the property sells for $2 million and it's a married couple, they get to keep 500,000 and then do an exchange on the remaining 1.5 million. Couple of things to note here. One, this does not work for everybody. If you need the money from your house to go buy a bigger house, it does not work. Also, it's not doing an exchange on just the excess gain. You're doing an exchange on everything, the entire sales price minus the exemption. A few years ago, I did one of these for a guy who sold a $20 million house. He was single. He got to keep 250000 and we had to do an exchange on the remaining 19.75. So again, doesn't work for everybody. If you have a client who would love to sell their house, they'd love to downsize, whatever, and they feel though that they feel trapped by the taxes because their gain on the property is so much, often in the millions of dollars, this is a great tax strategy for them. All right, so what other kinds of properties don't qualify for 1031? Well, second homes. Second homes are not considered to be investment real estate. Now, second homes are not just that beach place on the, on the coast that you'd like to go to on weekends. It also includes property that family member is living in rent-free. If you got a family member living in a property, you have to treat them like a regular tenant, including collecting market rate rent. Otherwise, it is not considered to be investment real estate. So second homes, Property is used for the benefit of the family, not investment real estate. Same thing with flips or development. You buy something, fix it up and sell it, buy a piece of land, build a house on it and sell it. The IRS calls that a job. It is not considered to be investment. It's considered to be property held for resale. And therefore, that's why flipping real estate does not qualify for 1031. Lastly, you cannot exchange into any kind of partnership or syndication, any kind, anything that's not direct ownership of real estate. So it has to be direct ownership of real estate to qualify for 1031. Now, you as an agent, you have a new listing. It's going to be a 1031 exchange. My first words of wisdom for you are don't panic. There's absolutely no difference in listing the property if it's going to be part of a 1031 or it's not. Everything is exactly the same. Same MLS, same tour, same purchase contract, same listing agreement, same title company. Everything is the same. There are only three little tiny things I want you to do extra if you're going to do an exchange. Number one, please make sure the client knows what they're doing. Make sure So I, I can provide material for the client. I can, I'm happy to talk to the client. You are welcome to schedule a conference call. You're welcome to give them my number. Make sure the client understands the rules because most people who have never been involved in a 1031 have at least one very serious misunderstanding about exchanges. So you want to make sure the client knows what they're getting into. Secondly, you do need to disclose to the seller, I'm sorry, disclose to the buyer that the seller is doing an exchange. This is often referred to as the cooperation clause. It's basically nothing more than seller to do 1031 or buyer to cooperate with seller's 1031 exchange. Again, it is solely a disclosure to the buyer that the seller is doing a 1031. It has no impact on them at all, but they need to be told about it. Lastly, please remember to call me and get the intermediary involved before escrow closes. If escrow closes, and you have not hired an intermediary, then the client will get the money and pay taxes. 
Otherwise, everything about your listing is exactly like any other listing. Now, you've sold your property. Now, the key here is how long do you have to buy the next property? The answer is very simple. You have 45 days to identify what you're going to buy and 180 days to buy it. 45 days to tell us what you're going to buy, 180 days to close escrow. Both those clocks start the day escrow closes. Now, what do we mean by identify? Identify means you are giving us the exact address to the property you are purchasing. It's 123 Main Street. It's not a house in San Jose. It's the exact property you're going to buy. So you have 45 days to tell us the exact property. Now, technically, do you have to be in contract? Technically, no. Technically, you just gave us a list of up to three property addresses. But if on day 46, all the ones that you've identified get sold to somebody else, you're screwed. So what it really means is by day 45, be in contract, have your inspections done, have your loan approved. You want to be locked into a property by the time you get to that 45 days. Now, is 45 days a lot of time? No, it's not. Uh, especially in today's market, lack of inventory. There's still a lot of issues where people... Are, are having trouble finding property within for that 45 days. So a couple of things to note. First is that that 45 day clock does start at the close of escrow. Ask for longer escrows. I just got a contract this morning. I swear this is true. Five day close. Does, this, does the buyer, does the seller know what she's gonna go buy in replacement? Nope. But for whatever reason, they accepted a five day escrow. Now, guess what? Her 45-day clock is going to start on Monday. So, um, you know, ask for longer escrows. Give yourself more time before the 45-day clock starts. And that's what's, what's going to be import, important. Now, I will also mention at this time that there is something called a reverse exchange. A reverse exchange is exactly what it sounds like. It means you're buying first. In today's market, because of the lack of inventory, we are doing a lot of these. I don't want to go too deeply into them, but just know that they do exist. They are they are much more complicated and, and expensive. But if you have a client who is afraid of not finding a property in the 45 days and they have the money to go buy another property, there is a way to buy first and then sell. Now we could avoid the, the whole fear of not finding a property within the 45 days. So uh, again, it's called a reverse exchange. If you got a client who may be interested, Call me and I'll be happy to walk them through it. All right. Now, next part that's important. How much do you need to spend to on the next property? And this is something that most people are wrong about. But it's very simple. All of it. Equal or greater to what you sell for. So if the property sells for a million dollars, you need to go buy at least a million dollars. Now, can you buy for more than a million? Absolutely. You can go up as much as you want. Can you buy multiple properties that add up to them? Yes, you can. You can buy, you can sell multiple properties to buy one. You can sell one and buy multiple. That's all okay. Can you buy for less than a million? The answer is actually yes, but you pay tax on the difference. That difference is often referred to as boot. Boot is what you pay tax on. So if you want to sell for a million, but you only find something you want to buy for 900, that's okay. You just pay tax on that last hundred thousand dollars. But it, again, the key here is it is equal or greater to what you sell the property for, not the equity, not the profit, everything. Part two, equally important, all the cash, all the proceeds have to go to the next property. Any cash you touch, you pay tax on. In this market, it's not as relevant but we had some situations a couple of years ago when interest rates were really, really low that they needed to, um, you know, the people were getting or maximizing their loan amounts. And often they were getting too big of a loan. If they got too big of a loan, they had cash left over, they're paying, they pay tax on that cash. So again, the takeaway here is that you want to buy property equal or greater in value and use all the cash. Obviously, if there was a loan on the property, that loan is going to get paid off at the close of escrow. But you need to replace the value of the debt, either with another loan or with cash from your pocket. 
but obviously that loan amount has to be made up to get to that equal or greater amount. So the bottom line is anything that you touch though, you pay taxes. The way I like to characterize it, you wanna buy property equal or greater in value and you wanna use at least all the equity that came from the sale. As long as you're doing all that, you are deferring all your taxes. Okay. Um, all right, so otherwise, that is the 1031 exchange. You're selling investment real estate, you're buying investment real estate. You gotta know what you're gonna buy in those 45 days. You gotta spend all the money. Otherwise, it really is not a difficult transaction. So now, what are some of the problems you have? What are some of the big issues that we have? And this is more for people, anybody that have done an exchange, you may have seen a few of these. First thing to know is family. The IRS hates your family. Actually not true. They know you hate your family. And you would never buy and sell property among family members if it weren't to, to cheat the IRS. And they're usually right. Um, so there are restrictions in the 1031 code with transactions done with related parties, such as, such as your parents, your children, your siblings. It could also be a corporate relationship. Um, but anytime anybody wants to sell and buy property among family members as part of an exchange, call me. Sometimes you can do it. Sometimes you cannot do it. Sometimes you can do it if you, if you follow certain rules. But you want to buy property, uh, especially if you're buying property. Buying property from family members is very problematic. So be very careful with transactions done with family. Number two, seller financing. Seller financing, I think, is a great strategy if you're looking to cash out. But if you're wanting to do an exchange, seller financing is terrible because that note almost always becomes taxable boot. Now, seller financing is not that common in urban areas, but it's very common in, in rural areas and with commercial and agricultural transactions. Um, but again, seller financing in 1031 is a problem. Third, the vesting. What's important in an exchange is it has to be the same taxpayer selling and buying. If Mike is selling, Mike has to buy. He can't buy the replacement. He, he can't sell his property and give the money to Danny to buy the replacement. Wh whoever is selling, that's who has to buy. And so where this becomes an issue is sometimes you will see properties held in some kind of partnership or LLC or some kind of entity. Well, guess what? That's who has to do the exchange. If everyone wants to go their own separate ways, that's a problem. Even adding a spouse is a problem. So my suggestion to you is whenever you get a new listing, call your favorite title company, get this magical document called a prelim, read it. Please make sure the people sitting across from you are the ones on title of the property. As long as it's the same parties selling and buying, not a problem. But any change in who that's gonna be, Please call me. We'll walk. We'll walk through it. Foreign sellers. Now, can foreign sellers do an exchange? The answer is yes. Any entity can do an exchange. Corporation sells. Corporation buys. LLC sells. LLC buys. Foreign person sells. Foreign person buys. However, where it becomes an issue though is for foreign sellers are often subject to what's called FERPTA, the Federal Withholding of income tax. And this is for people who are not U.S. citizens or permanent residents. And that FERPTA is going to be withheld even if they're doing an exchange. So you have to be very careful with foreign, with, with clients who are foreign sellers and buyers. Note that the also, they also must have a U.S. Social Security or tax ID number. If they do not have a tax ID number, we cannot do an exchange for them. Um, so my suggestion to you is if you ever have a situation where you're dealing with a client who's not a U.S. citizen or permanent resident, let both us and the title company know up front as early as possible so that they know uh, that you're doing an exchange. Lastly, the, the intermediary, what we do as the intermediary is not regulated please make sure the clients are only working with very large, very safe companies because our job is to hold their money. 
They want to make sure that money is safe. And, uh, and what we do as an industry is not regulated at all. So you want to make sure you're working with, with very large companies, lots of bonding, lots of insurance, lots of guarantees that the money's client is being protected. Most small companies do not have any of that. So for this, for the small amount we charge for doing an exchange, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's better for us that to focus on the security of the money rather than maybe saving a hundred bucks. All right. There are some myths people that people have when it comes to exchanges. Um, believe it or not, sometimes going back in time, when people did exchanges, they had to be done the same day. It used to be called a simultaneous exchange because you're buying property the same day, buying and selling the same day. That's gone. But a lot of older people especially still think that you have to buy and sell the same day. Also, a lot of people are afraid of doing exchanges because they think it's either very expensive or very messy. And it is. It's inexpensive. It's easy to do. And, um, you know, I've done them for $25,000 lots before I've done them for $150 million office building. It's the paperwork is the same. It's it's very easy to do. Um, a lot of uh, people are afraid of that it's going to trigger an audit by the IRS. No, it doesn't. It's You're not any more likely to get audited just because you're doing an exchange. Um, also, a lot of, of accountants even don't realize that the property can be both an investment property and a primary at the same time. It does happen. I mean, uh, the simplest example there is a duplex. I live in one side, rent out the other. That does qualify for 1031 for the rental portion of the property. So a lot of accountants have a heart, I get hung up on this, but it is not a big deal. All right. So that in a nutshell is the 1031 exchange. There's not a lot of complexity to it. Um, but here's the more fun part. Let's use this thing about 1031 as a marketing tool. Why do people do 1031 exchange? Guess what? It's not just to defer taxes. Most people, if, if you don't want to pay taxes, what do you do? You don't sell the property. If you don't sell the property, you're not paying taxes. The reason people do an exchange is because they want to buy something better. Now, what does better mean? Better means whatever the hell the client wants it to mean. It could be, I want to sell my rental house for something with better income. It could be, I want to go buy a house in Hawaii because when I retire, I'm going to move to Hawaii. It could be, I'm moving to Arizona, so I'm moving my rentals to Arizona. It could be, I'm tired of managing real estate. I'm looking for something easier to manage. The bottom line is, you do an exchange because you want to buy something better. And that term better is subjective. It's however the client wants it to be. But if you think about it, 1031 is a very powerful tool because it allows you to get from the property you own today to the property you want to own tomorrow. So when you're dealing with investors, don't focus on deferring taxes. Focus on what do you want out of your real estate? What are you looking for that you're not getting today? 1031 is a tool that allows you to get from what you own today to what you want to own tomorrow. And with that, that is pretty much it. Um, you know, again, the exchange rules, exchange process, not very difficult. Um, before I move on, I want to say a couple of things here. Um, first off, I am happy to help you with your clients at any time. Um, you know, again, you're welcome to give them my number. You're welcome to call me, say, please call my client. However, I can best help you help your client. Use me. I've been doing this a long time. I'm not going anywhere, knock on wood. And so um, hopefully I get a chance to help you. Um, I also do want to mention that I do have a newsletter I put out on 1031 and tax-related information. If you're interested, it comes out once a month. I'm not going to bombard you with stuff. I'm not going to... Um, sell your information to anybody else. If you're interested in getting my newsletter, send me a text or send me an email. I'll make sure you get added in. But again, our goal here is to help you get your um, clients uh, you know, situated when it comes to their 1031. You are welcome also to use my newsletter in your own marketing uh, if you want to reach out to investors yourself. So 
hopefully that gives you some ideas. Again, if you're interested, just send me your email address and I add you to the mailing list. And with that, that is the part of the 1031 I have for you. Um, and let's see if anybody has any questions. Just have a quick question for you. Do you serve Southern California as well? Um, I do exchange all over. I do exchange all over the country. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I got, I got clients all over. So I do stuff in SoCal all the time. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. Um, all right. So do you I'm have any marketing materials that we can use to share? Yeah. As a matter of fact, I'll, I'll go a step farther. If there's any one topic that you wanted, if you want to hear more about primary residence, if you want to hear more about, uh, vacation rentals, if you want to hear about, um, any specific topic we talked about today, I pretty much have a one page PDF on the whole thing. And I have one uh, FAQ page that when someone says, hey, I want to read up about 1031, I send them this one page, 95% of their questions will get answered in, in by, by reading that. So it's a very uh, comprehensive FAQ that goes through vast majority of client situations. I have that, happy to send it to you, ping me with an email or, or text, and I'll make sure you get added in. Thank you. All right. Um, there is a question in the chat box. Can you split the game and do a 1031? I'm not sure exactly what you mean. Danny, you want to unmute yourself and, and explain that a little bit better? Yeah, sorry, Ron. Yeah. Um, just to elaborate, and just uh, I think you explained it earlier. You indicated that that uh, when you sell your, let's say, rental property and you've uh, gotten some considerable amount of gain, right? Uh, can you split the gain or you have to split uh, the total proceed so that uh, no no money um, transfers to you? So it means that you can you get two 1031 exchange with that one sale? Right. So you can sell one property and buy two or three or 10 properties. I did an exchange once for a woman who went to Las Vegas is about 18 houses. So yeah, you can you can definitely split it up as long as in total, everything is equal or greater to what you sell the property for. Again, not the gain, sales price. So if you sell for a million dollars, you wanna buy three properties that add up to a million, perfectly okay. I, in fact, this morning I spoke with a, a, a guy, um, his specialty is houses out in like Oklahoma or something that run for about 300,000 bucks. His client is selling a house here in San Jose for, a million five, and he's going to have them buy five houses at 300,000 bucks each. Perfectly okay. Again, anything less, if you buy anything less than what you sell the property for, though, you pay tax on that difference. It's not just reinvesting the gain, it's reinvesting everything. Okay, thank you, Vaughn. Sure. All right. Does anybody else have any questions? There, there, there was not a lot in the chat box today. So if anybody has a question, you want to just either, either raise your hand or unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Hey, Ron, uh, I have a question. Yes, sir. For the reverse exchange, what's the time limit? Um, it's, it's the same as a regular exchange. So uh, in a regular exchange, you have 45 days to tell us what you're going to buy and 180 days to actually buy it. In a reverse exchange, exact same thing. 45 days to tell us what you're going to sell and 180 days to actually sell. So, you, you, so you have, everything has to be done within the same 180 day of guideline. I see, and in case that timeline is not met, then uh, it's considered a normal sale? Then, well, if you haven't sold your property within that 180 days, then we give you the new property and now you own both of them. Mm -hmm. I see, thank you. Ron, no can you explain Delaware statutory trusts and how they work? Sure, all right, so, um, one of the uh, areas we didn't talk about today, but um, is, you know, sometimes uh, when people, especially when they get older, one of the main reasons that they do exchanges is that they are tired of actively managing real estate. So when you talk to people who um, are basically sick of being landlords, so what are their options? Well, obviously they could just sell and pay taxes, but if they want to do an exchange into, into something, what are their options? There are two options they that a client really has if they want what I'll call hands-off management. The first one is where you buy commercial real estate, but typically we're talking about what's called net lease or triple net properties. 
that's where you're buying a McDonald's, you're buying a Jiffy Lube, you're buying a Walgreens. You're basically buying a business, not but you're not buying the business, you're buying the land underneath the business and leasing it to a major corporation. Um, these typically have very long leases um, and very hands-off management. So in, in terms of having to manage it because the tenant takes care of all the taxes, all the insurance, all the maintenance. And so that's why it's referred to as triple net. So that's one solution. The problem is most of us don't have 3 million bucks to go buy a McDonald's. We, we only have a few hundred thousand. So what do we, what are our options? Our options are to buy something that's much, that's a fractional interest in commercial real estate. There's something called a Delaware statutory trust where people, these companies out there uh, referred to as sponsors will buy very large properties. We're talking 50 to a hundred million dollars. And they'll get a loan on them and then they'll come out and essentially offer it to the public. So if you have a million dollars, you can buy a million dollars worth of that hundred million dollar property. If I got a hundred thousand, I could buy a hundred thousand dollars worth of that million dollar property. So it's fractional interest in commercial real estate. Now, there are advantages to it. Number one advantage, again, very little management, also very predictable cash flow because these are typically very well. Um, uh, seasoned properties, but there's also a big negative to them. And that is that your money is not liquid. It is not a parking lot that you can get your money out in two years. If you want to go do something else, your money is stuck there until the sponsor decides it's time to sell it and move on to the next one. So you're probably looking at, you know, four to eight years uh, being in here again, for a lot of people who are looking just to get out of actively managing real estate, DSTs are good things, to, good options to look into because it does allow them the flexibility to get out of you know, having to be a landlord, and they don't care about you know manipulating their their real estate uh, on a regular basis. But if they want to have control of the asset when they when it's sold, when it's purchased, etc., then this is probably not the best solution for them. All right? Anybody else have any questions? Well, I'm just impressed that when I started, there were eight of you on the phone call. Now there are 26. I'm, I'm pretty, very happy with that. Um, last chance here. Mike, did you, is there anything else that uh, specifically you wanted me to talk about today? I think we're good. You must have uh, satisfied all their curiosity. Either that, or put them, or either that or put them to sleep. I'm not sure which. Well, it wasn't too taxing for them, I, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. All right. One last chance. Any more questions anybody has? If you again feel free to reach out to me, call me, text me, uh, email, however I can best help you help your clients. If you've got follow up questions for today, or you want to read up any uh, read up on any additional information, um, go ahead and send it out to me and send me what you need, and I'll be happy to uh, send you some of those PDFs. So thank you very much for your time, Mike. Thank you very much for for having me uh, speak to your group. I'm looking forward to to working with all of you. Thank you, Ron. Thanks a lot, Ron. All right, guys, take care.